What's going on guys? How are you? It's Waco from Revolution and the Rake Magazine here with my buddy Yoni Ben Yehuda, uh, the head of business development at an incredible place called Material Good. Real game changer in, in the sort of high-end watch game. Thank uh, you. Here to talk about watches with him because he's one of my favorite people here in New York. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we met, which I thought was quite funny. Uh, we had become kind of buddies in passing. And I remember one day I was uh, on Instagram and I posted something and I said, in the words of Dr. Dre, Booyah Kashan. Right? And then he immediately messaged me to say, you mean in the words of Dr. Dre, quoting KRS-One, yep. which I was like, and which yep. it's true because Buya Kashan comes from Mad yep. Crew, that's, yep. right? that's right. And I was later to learn that, that Yoni actually is an expert in all things hip hop, in particular hip hop from the golden era of hip hop, 90s New York. 100%. Right? Uh, so I, I, I don't know if I would call myself an expert, yes. but right. I grew up here in the city and you know, to me, 1992, I feel like I'm, I'm certainly dating myself. Right? Yes. 1992 to early 2000s to me is the golden age of hip hop. Absolutely. Uh, there are some great artists today. Yes. Uh, Kendrick Lamar is great. J. Cole is great, right. uh, Joyner is great, and then some of those older artists are still making, to me, great music. Yes. But I mean, back then, it was like every two weeks, there was an amazing hip hop album that came out. And that period of New York is particularly interesting because yeah. it was a response to California, right? Right. I mean, uh, you know, New York, as we all know, which we all agree. The uh, birthplace. Birthplace of hip hop, Bronx. That's Kool right. Herc, That's right. Grandmaster Flash, you know, that That's kind right. of thing. Um, but then suddenly the Californians took it over and the, the rise of gangster rap in the late 80s mm -hmm. um, made this huge geographical shift in terms of the focus of hip hop to California, right? Correct. In fact, there was only two, to my mind, two, two amazing um, uh, groups that came out of the late 80s, early 90s. One would be Public Enemy. And the second, which is the is is the Beastie Boys, which mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it was funny because people originally perceived them as a novelty act, and then they came out with Paul's Boutique after that, and which was also classic. Inc I mean, incredible yeah. from a musical perspective was extraordinary. One hundred percent. Yeah. But in the meantime, out in the 80s, you had Dre, and he was like, uh, you know, incredibly textured, incredibly layered um, in terms of the, the production quality of his rap. Um, and then you had in New York this whole kind of grimy uh, a, a scene, which we love, correct? Right, yeah, 100%. And, and which mean, were like, two sort of your favorite albums from that era? I mean, I can't choose two favorite albums. Right. Uh, I can give you highlights from that era. Uh, I would say Illmatic. Nice, yeah, uh, incredible. And he did it while he's so young as well. Right. Yes. Uh, the Low End Theory. Yes. Uh, tribe. Uh, and then 94, I would say Reasonable Doubt. Yes. Uh, obviously, Ready to Die. Yes. Oh, Ready to uh, Die is incredible. Yes. Uh, 36 Chambers was yeah. also 94. I feel like 94 and 96 were like the two greatest years yeah. in hip hop. 94 was uh, like the 1941 for watches when Paddock came out with oh, 1518 and 1526, that's right? Uh, two of the most uh, seminal watches. And in 94, yeah. you had Ready to Die uh, from B.I.G., who yeah. was, you know, uh, poised to be, and to many, still consider him to be one of the greatest of all time, if not the greatest of all time. And then in, in 94, you also had uh, the 36 Chambers right. uh, from, from Wu Tang, which, right. was, which is amazing that these guys were from Staten Island of all places, which growing up in New York, you know, is not. It's not, it's not, it wasn't the borough, but like <laughs> still to this day, we, you know, if you ask someone where they're from, right. and they're from Staten Island, they say, I'm from Shaolin. Yes. And it shows you like the impact so many years later that this album had on people that it like it created the nomenclature for how people refer to a borough exactly uh and 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 the many albums after that yes. too that Wuta, you know it wasn't yeah. a one and done for any of these right on the west coast then you had doggy style yeah which admittedly i'm not a big west coast 90s hip-hop no, guy am I. No. uh but i i you know respect yes. it um, yes. You know who else is a, a, a big hip hop guy is, is Michael Friedman. Oh really? Uh, he is. Wait, uh, hang on, Michael Friedman from Odom Yeah, Pige. Yes. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's he's so like, funny. He's a, he's a great he's a great hip hop mind, and anytime we talk, we end up talking about you know timepieces and, and yes. hip hop as well. Yes. So he's he's a great one. Next time yes. you see him, to. So I think that uh, the commonality we're talking about here, whether we're talking about Thirty Six Chambers or Illmatic. Um, or Ready to Die is we're talking about game changers musically. Yes. And I noticed that in your collection of watches, which you brought today, are a lot of game changers horologically. Yeah. And let's start maybe with the first watch that's on your wrist, which is sure. an AP B so, Series so, 402 Steel. So I think uh, one of the most important timepieces ever made, if not the most important timepiece, as yes. far as I'm concerned. Not necessarily a B Series, but a 5402. Yes. So thinking about what it meant to AP and thinking about the historical context and kind of saying, you know, the historical context of, of music and, and when albums come out and what they mean. And, you know, this is the height of the quartz crisis. Yes. 
this is you know the or may, maybe not the height but a, but a, a, you know a, the cor the courts crisis is on the rise yes uh, i mean people are and, feeling it right know, yeah, yeah. Right. and then and then ap comes out with this timepiece which cost uh, like you said, the same price as a Jaguar. Yeah, back 3,600 Swiss uh, francs back in 1972. You could have bought a Jaguar, you could have bought 22 to 25 Rolex of Mariners. Right. I mean, it uh, was crazy. And then you have yeah. this all steel watch yes. that really, I think, revolutionized watchmaking. Yes. And, and I, till this day, the design language of the Royal Oak yes. is felt in so many different yes. brands. Yes. Um, and, and, and style in general, you know, you think about classic 70s style, uh, this timepiece to me helped set the stage for what we define uh, iconic design as, period, in the modern era. Absolutely. There was, there was no sort of luxury sports watch to that right. era. Correct. A sports watch was based on a tool watch. It's Correct. Kind of, you know, such, for yeah. example, your Samarina. But or, was a meant to be a, or, or a Daytona. Or a Daytona. But it was meant to be a watch you put on and you put through the paces right. as a driver, as a diver, right. or whatever. Um, and this was meant for a different audience. It was meant for that, you know, kind of playboy, right. on a yacht, the Riviera chic kind of guy. The, and and the Italian and the Italians really, really took a liking to this watch. Yes, uh, which made it kind of uh, a, a huge hit. So the uh, the story, as you, you know, as it goes, was when this timepiece came out. Yeah, uh, it didn't immediately catch on. That's right. And it wasn't until the CEO of Fiat really wore it on the cover yes. of, of of a magazine. Yes. And also the Italian market started to take to yes. it. Then those timepieces flew. It, yes. it took a while to sell the the A series, the first two thousand. So in the context uh, of the the sort of early seventies, the coolest man on the planet is Gianni Agnelli. Right. right? Yeah. Uh, that who who Yoni is referencing. And the whole, and, and people would look at him in terms of his style. You know, he kind of created that whole very degage style of wearing a double-breasted cottageni, but open. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, he, they used to call him the Rake of the Riviera for his various <laughs> romantic conquests. Not that I, you know, I'm sure they're all not true, but nonetheless, it's great stories. Um, uh, I'm saying that for a disclaimer. I'm sure they actually are true. And, and they, <laughs> Just in the, case the, someone gives you a call and they're like, hey, exactly. Uh, in case Lapa was like, wait, exactly. how can you say that shit? You know, exactly. like, you know, um, then, uh, but the, the, I always kind of imagine a conversation between him and his friend, you know, and like I imagine he's kind of just chilling, he's wearing his, you know, A series Royal Oak, a steel watch to cost the same as a Jaguar. And let, let his buddy kind of rolls up to him and let's call his friend, you know, uh, I don't know, um, what's an Italian name? Uh, Mar Mario. And Mario goes to Gianni, Gianni, look at your watch. Oh, that's fantastic. This is the Royal Oak. And he's like, excuse my Italian accent. He's like, yes. That was amazing. And then he's like, but Gianni, explain to me, this watch, it costs the same of a, as a Jaguar. I mean, What's the point of that? And then Johnny's response, in my mind, would be, that is the point, you know? And because it's like, it's not a question of absolute value. It's a question of like, this thing is so stylish. It's so game changing. Um, the whole design of the watch by the legend that is Gerald Genta is to create something that is, you know, kind of, if you look at it, it's incredibly imposing, but then when you turn it sideways, it's so slim and elegant. That's such a good point. First integrated rate bracelet watch. Yeah, it's, and thanks to using the Caliber 2121, which was the, right. the Jaeger design, Caliber 920. And Patek. And, and Patek also mm. used it for the Nautilus mm. uh, later in, in 76. So it, it, if you look at that watch, it's just so different from anything else. And I think that's what's so cool about it, you know? And and so the, the reason I was, uh, you know, I chose this one for today is to me to find one that is truly this honest yes. is, is, is special. So, yes. you know, unpolished, original dial, unsigned crown. Oh, beautiful. The, the correct font on the, on the date wheel, you know, the original hands and even the original clasp. So, yes. you know, most of them will have the AP clasp, yes. uh, which is, you know, not, not, not the original in most cases, but also not a, a terrible thing because those clasps, you know, broke. But yes. to find one that had everything in this condition was, right. you know, kind of rare and yes. meaningful to me. And being, you know, an authorized retailer for AP and, and, and working with uh, material good, I, I find this watch to be that much more important. Incredible. So let's kind of like move forward now through time. We're take quite a sort of jump towards modern day. And I kind of feel as if the equivalent of that today is the Richard Mill, and in particular the RM35. Yeah, and, and and I think that that's a really good point. And you know, this is the interesting thing to me about this watch, and this was my first RM, is that it's both quintessential RM, yes, and also completely different than the modern design of RM. Yes. Uh, so obviously the tonneau shape, the cambered case. Uh, the whole watch weighs 50, you know, grams total, including the clasp, and then and then you have this beautiful three-dimensional movement, a manual wound movement, uh, that I think just sings to the importance 
of, of, of Richard Mille as both a, a, a designer and a, and a watch brand. Yes. Uh, and, and funny enough, when I wear this watch, very few people ever say anything. Really? Yeah. It's That's not, so funny. It is like the low key RM. The most low key, right? right yeah. yeah, exactly. Which right. is, you know, probably uh, yeah. an oxymoron. But Unless someone who knows it knows exactly. it. Exactly. they just lose their mind. Exactly. Right? Yeah, and, that's, yeah. and that's, and that's, and a part of my collecting today is like, uh, you know, for the people who have an appreciation. Yes. I collect for myself. Yes. But the watches that I'm drawn to are watches that nine out of ten times people won't really notice except for the g-shock yes <laughs> uh, uh, that people won't really notice but the people who do i i would love to you know talk to and yes. have a conversation with and they have and, a kind uh, of similar perspective right and they're cool right people, and, and just nerd out with them yes uh and and you know that's a and that's a a, a very much a red bar thing too uh, nice. which we're going to well. talk about later yeah yes. You know what I think is so cool about this watch is, you know, it's, it's sort of brother. You know, the 27 came out, which is the watch that Richard Mille created for Rafael Nadal. Um, I remember watching the U.S. Open, and all John McEnroe, who was commentating, all he could do was talk about the watch. That's so funny, right? Which, which was like the best marketing conceivable, ever. right? Yes, because it was like, I cannot believe it. How can he be playing tennis with a watch that costs half a million dollars? But I love the fact that Richard. I wish I could get one for half a million dollars, yeah, right? Today, yeah. <laughs> a 27, uh, right? Uh, uh, 27 uh, today would be worth uh, yeah. more than double yeah. that, right? But but um, he he just couldn't stop talking about it. It was great marketing for it. But the thing that was great about that that first Flushing Meadows where he wore that watch was he won yes. as well yeah. while wearing that watch also a great demonstration that Richard is creating watches so it was a mechanical tourbillon you know with a, for a forged carbon case with an aluminum lithium uh, movement but that you could actually be an athlete and you could wear while performing at your very best you and know? and an athlete where the the racket experiences i think something like 40,000 g yes. force yes. where the tourbillon doesn't get knocked off its axis absolutely i mean just Think about that. Historically, every turb before that was worn from, you know, the safe to the gala yes. and then back, and back into the safe, back. right? Exactly. Like people didn't, don't even breathe on it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, don't, like. don't even think about it in your sleep. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, that's an, that's an AP connection with APRP. Yes. Uh, building those movements with uh, Richard. Right. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that that's a true testament to the future of watchmaking. I see the movements being made by RM and the timepieces being made uh, akin to what I assume Abraham Breguet was doing yes. in, in, the, in the 1700s yeah. where he was so forward thinking That's right. that everything he did was like, was game changing. holy shit, or yeah. soccer blue or whatever. whatever, whatever <laughs> the, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think that I think that that's kind of what we're experiencing Amazing. with RM and APRP and, and a lot of the AP timepieces too, the concept as well. Yes. This is a great watch also because, again, there's no compromise to it. You know, it, it's a super light watch. It's got a forged carbon case. It's interesting, too, because I know Richard uh, changed the way he created his cases with the carbon fiber cases. He made it a two-part case with a solid case yeah. back on this model, which I love, because all the action for the watch is in the front of the watch right, anyway. Right. Skeletonized titanium movement. You know, it's essentially a time-only watch, but what an amazing time-only watch. 100%. And, and, and everyone, super legible, right? People don't really give it credit super for Super legible. Super legible. And, Yoni, you know, I, I know you You are a soul cycle guy like I am as well. Uh, yeah. Is this conceivably a sports watch? I, would, I don't wear? understand how we were talking before <laughs> this and you were saying that you wear some of these watches I, to Seoul. I do. I wear my RM21 I to Seoul. I don't even understand yeah. it. Like, yeah. I won't, I can't even, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Aside from the fact that I'm, like, sweating like an animal, like, I'd be so nervous. It would, I, I'm the sweatiest man on earth. I'm one hair short of a, I'm, pr I'm one hair short of a gorilla. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the proof of evolution. So, <laughs> so like, so like uh, I, I, there's you know, no I don't think that it's dependent on that because I, being Chinese, I have very little hair. Oh, okay, uh, good. Uh, well, however, um, it, it just like water is just shooting out of my pores. I, like, like, it's just disgusting. I like, people look at me and they gasp in horror. You know, it, I, it's a, I couldn't even uh, imagine wearing these watches yes. to Seoul. I have a, a, a dear friend of mine uh, whose whose daughter is an instructor. Yes, uh, her name is Maya, and she's one of the one of the great Seoul instructors. Fantastic. We were we were talking about our favorite instructors, and he wears a Nautilus, 
uh, really? to Seoul. Oh, that's yeah. so funny. Uh, I think he might wear a 3700 to right. Seoul. And to me, that's really? like, that, yeah, like <laughs> well, he's wearing the original Nautilus. Like, that's Seoul. insane that's to me. That's a $100,000 watch. Yeah, like, dollars. what the hell? So, on the subject of Nautilus, and I think the whole world, as you've seen recently with all the auction results, has gone Nautilus crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about a 3700 1A, which is the original one from 76, um, or up to the 80s, I think. Um, or you're talking about a 5711, which is the sure. new version of it, or 5712, which is got Tiffany the Tiffany you know, dials. Yes, yeah. exactly. Or, or, or even the new perpetual calendar. People are basically losing their minds for these 100%. watches. And, and very much, you know, understandably so, because they are amazing watches and actually fall perfectly in that kind of zone between great style, but also a great sports chic watch, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to be dressed up and to look cool with a Nautilus, super but you versatile. can be super dressed yeah. up and look cool with a Nautilus Super well. versatile watch. And what I love about Nautilus is too, and it probably speaks to the guys here in Material Good, is like Nautilus's appeal to the guy who's super dressed up in his bespoke three-piece suit, but they also appeal to the guy that's super into his, you know, his streetwear yeah. and his Lamborghinis and stuff yeah. like that. But they appeal across. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Why, why do you think that is? So, you know, we've had uh, pre-owned and vintage Nautili, whatever the plural. <laughs> I like that though. We're going to start uh, plural for Nautilus yeah. shall be Nautili uh, from this yeah. moment forward. Uh, yeah. You know, since since you know we've had a lot of vintage uh, Patek uh, as well. Yes. And um, I I think the the reason that people love this watch is it is incredibly versatile and incredibly. Uh, uh, High key and low key. Yes. Right. It depends on it depends on who you're sitting with. Yes. And it depends on how you wear it. And very and, much so. And, yeah. and I think it's a I think it's an amazing watch. I've I've always and you know I'll say this publicly I I always prefer the 5402 to the 3700 um, just because it came first and I think you know the importance of it kind of being first. But I think Genta followed up. I'm thinking of like a hip hop equivalent. So like it's like following up. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Illmatic with with it was written like right. uh, it's like following up one monster yes with, and clearly influenced another. by right the first one right exactly but also bringing its uh, own spin to yeah, it as well yeah yeah uh -huh. I think the presence of these watches is incredible what I think it, what's great about both Royal Oaks <laughs> and about Nautilus or Not a Lie is that I love you, that yeah, I, I love that that just happened. It's, it's a thing yeah. and and uh, from across the room you know what it is right yeah and, and yeah. it's so unique it's so distinct and it's not just from an absolute value perspective it's not covered with diamonds necessarily sure it's not it doesn't have to be in precious metal but it's just cool yeah so I I love the fact that that you have chosen one of my favorite Nautiluses or not a lot uh, <laughs> the 5726 yes which is an annual calendar yeah. Nautilus yep. um, and which people don't kind of like realize what an amazing value this watch I is at the moment fully agree I think that this is the most if you can say this about any Nautilus the most slept on Nautilus yes. that exists I think it's a it's a big comp. Yes. I think it's incredibly well executed. I so balanced. Right? I, I love the I love the 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 weight of the uh, the head of the timepiece. Right. I, and I and I I like that it's a little raised over the 5711. Yes. I I like the the thinness of the 5711, but yeah. I like the presence of this more. Yeah. And I think that when people, you know, talk about their dream, uh, you know, uh, Nautilus. Uh, I think this one rarely gets brought up, and that's one of the reasons I loved it. Incredible. Uh, I love the gray, you know, the slate gray dial, and I just, I think it's such a good watch. It's uh, an amazing watch, and I love the fact that it's got an annual calendar, yeah. because this and is that, a complication created by Paddock. You know? Right, exactly, yeah. by Stern. Yes. Uh, and, the, um, and the analog date window to yes. me is super, super, super Absolutely cool. beautiful. Okay, so let's go from there to another one of those sort of big boys in the horological scene, and I guess that you know, there no man can really have a watch collector check without a Rolex in his collection, right? I know, I know, I know. And you know, my first, uh, the first time I bought my first Rolex, it was, and I was thinking, I should have maybe brought it too, but it was, I still have it. It was a two-tone Datejust right. with a champagne dial. Right. And I felt like it was like a moment for me. Really? You know, yeah. I love I, the two-tone ones as well. Uh, They're cool. It, like, it was like 15 years ago. Yes. I had, I like saved up for it. I thought about it. I went to the to the boutique. I saw it a hundred times. Like, I, it was such a, a thing for me. And and uh, I still have that with like, you know, this being my first RM. And right. I had that same emotion. My first paddock, which I didn't bring with me. Right. Uh, I had that same emotion. And like... Uh, to me, 
that Rolex was important. And that Rolex, I think, was the beginning of me refining my collecting. Because up until then, I, there was no thought or through line. Sure. I was like, oh, I, there's a, a, a memo box for $1,500 that says, you know, Le Cotre on the dial. Great, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, take yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. There's exactly. a, you know, this and, the, and then. But now you, became, you, you started to enforce your, a little bit more self-control and a little bit more focus, right? Yeah, I'd say <laughs> hardly self-control. <laughs> like, I don't really do very well with self-control. But... Tell, tell me about, about this specific Daytona. Ceramic sure. bezel, in-house movement, <laughs> steel watch. I mean, yeah. hard watch to find. Yeah. Um, but what about this model? And you, you got the, uh, the, the, the white dial. Yeah. I, I prefer the panda yeah. to, to the black dial. Right. Uh, you know, I, I've i had, you know, Zenith uh, Daytonas and, and, and different Daytonas and, and non-Zenith before that. Right. To me, of the non-vintage Daytonas, yes. this is one of the most beautiful watches I've I totally agree. Uh, the other thing that I like about this watch is it's versatile in the opposite way because um, you can see this watch on the richest, most powerful person, and right. it makes sense. Yes. And you can see this watch on a person who's beginning their collection, and yes. it makes sense. And let's not forget also on women. This yes, like, yes. At Soul Cycle, in the front row of Soul Cycle, everyone's wearing a like gold Daytona. Daytona. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Over and I'm like, wow. <laughs> no, but in some ways, I, I love the fact that uh, the Daytona has been co-opted by, by the ladies. Yes. Because it, it looks even kind of cooler on them as yeah. well. You know? like, Everything looks cooler on, yes. on, on, on a stylish. So I, I just want, you know, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about, about um, Rolex because there's always this thing where people are like, oh, but why doesn't Rolex kind of repeat their past? Why don't they do like a Paul Newman? Why don't they do this? The fact is, I actually respect the fact that they don't repeat their past, right? You know, I have a friend, his name's Flavio Manzoni, and he's the, the creative director of Ferrari. And he makes a conscious effort not to create vintage theme cars, which I think is a trick that a lot of people do because it's easy, right? And it's like that J line, uh, bringing it back to, to hip hop. If, yes. if you if you want to hear my old stuff, buy my old album. Exactly, right? Uh, yes, and, well, well said, you yeah. know? And, uh, and so that's the thing. And, and if you look at the, for example, the LaFerrari or the 488, you know, and the 488 maybe is a really good example because it's our first turbocharged car as well, um, uh, mid-engine turbocharged car. Uh, that car is, um, uh, the entire body is influenced by airflow, right? There's no language they're taking from the past as opposed to a lot of other car makers which are kind of directly quoting their past. And I like the fact that Rolex is not directly quoting their past. They're not living off of their past because they don't need to. I guess one little sort of like wink that you could, you could associate with is that the black bezel here Reminds you a little bit right. of the 6241, right? Uh, you know, sure. or, or the 6263, um, which are the acrylic bezel watches from the sort of uh, late 60s through the 70s. However, in this case, it's, it's made of a very different material. That's right. It's made from the ceramic. Exactly. Uh, and and uh, and I like this watch. When I travel, this is the watch I probably most often travel with. Yes. Uh, because. Uh, really, you can wear it anywhere, yes. and 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 you know that that's something that I I love about it. And there there is something kind of spectacular about a Daytona. I Fantastic. think it is, it is you know one of the most well balanced timepieces. Oh yeah, uh, it's hard. I mean, it, it, today it would be hard for you to design a more perfect. Uh, chronograph than the Daytona. Uh, fully, I, yeah. I, I, I think that that's yeah. true. I think that there are a lot of great chronographs out there and you know the datograph being one of them. Yes. Uh, and obviously a very, yeah. very, very different animal. Yes. Uh, but there's something about the balance of a Daytona that's always been spectacular yes. to me. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, and from there, let's go to an independent watchmaker named François Paul Journe. That's right. Uh, you have his chronometer, but not just any chronometer, one that's made in Tantalum, the Chronometre Bleu, right. which is his most sought after watch. Yes, you know? yeah. You know, <laughs> I was thinking about what timepieces to bring, and like, I I'm a big believer and a big proponent of just buying from your heart. Right. Buy what moves you. Yes. You know, don't just buy you know, like the quote unquote popular timepieces. And then I looked at the timepieces I brought and I was like, uh. And they're all worth that uh, <laughs> uh, But, uh, so I, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of uh, getting to know Mr. Jorn and, and, and also spending a, a good amount of time at, at the boutique there. And, and they're, uh, you know, amazing people and it's an amazing brand. And, and I, I went to the manufacturer and I actually met you know, one of the few things that is exciting that you can still get with a Jorn is I met the watchmaker who worked on my watch. Wow. Uh, so cool. I, I went there and I, I took a photo with him and you can see he's so uncomfortable on the photo and he's just like, <laughs> please, I don't care. Like, great, I'm happy, let me get back to work. And I'm That's like, oh, right. look, I'm the artist. Uh, 
And but that's great. And I love the fact that he's, he's making watches in Geneva. You yeah, know, like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and he's still kind of just wandering around looking at these 100, guys. A hundred percent. I think he's, he's one of the great living watchmakers. Absolutely. Um, and to me, this watch is quite special for a few reasons. One is, I can't think of another enamel or non-enamel dial that looks so different no matter how you wear it or the angle of your hand mm -hmm. or the sunlight or, you know, the, the, the way that this blue... I, I believe that there's very few blues on earth that that match this. Mm -hmm. I would say, may, you know, the 15202 is, yeah. is an incredibly deep, rich blue. Yes. Uh, but the 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 way this timepiece is changes cha changes in light is just unbelievable. Fantastic. I, I think the hands also complement it. And then. And the white hands are great. Like oh, a, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, and it, there's like such a modern kind of touch yes. to it, right? Uh, and then the thing to me that always gets me with this watch is uh, the movement. I would say one of the most... Which is in rose gold, yes, incidentally. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most beautiful movements ever designed. Yes. Uh, you know, I would, I would wear this watch uh, movement up if yeah. I could. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I just think it's art. Amazing. And then I had the special uh, strap put on it to, nice. to match. Well, it's funny that you, because you, you were mentioning, and this is, I love the fact that you said you just buy things that, that appeal to you from an emotional perspective. Um, but every watch, the Richard Mille, the Daytona, the, the, the Chronometre Bleu, um, and, and clearly the AP, they're all great investments, 100%. Right? And, 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 and I think that, you know, watches as an investment is a, I don't know if a relatively new concept, yes. but a, a relatively new concept to be discussed yes. the way it is. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it kind of goes back to, you know, you go back to like 1960 or whatever, you know, a certificate of deposit was basically a way that you would type your cash for a year or for five years, um, and then you'd earn interest off of it, right? So the old saying was like, oh, if you get $5 million, you put it all in the bank, you just live off the interest for the right. rest of your life. exactly. So back in the 60s, or 1960, I guess the interest rate was like about 5%. So you $5 million, you got 250 grand that you can, you know, spend every year, that's right? That's a lot of, that's I mean, money. That, you know what I'm saying, yeah. right? And then, but, but then, uh, and in, 19, in the 1980s, when there were, in 81 here where there was an economic crisis, the interest rate for certificate of deposits went up to like 15%. I mean, that's crazy, you know? So right. I would be just plowing all my cash into that. Sure. But today, if you want to put your money in the bank, you're going to get a return of 0.2 to 0.4%. Right. And you're welcome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and exactly. that's not even going to keep up with the rate of inflation. <laughs> 100%. I mean, by a long shot. Yeah. So uh, this has kind of, in some ways, created a whole new um, category of appreciable assets. And watches and cars, and I would art. say, in art would be three of mm -hmm. those, you know, and, and which is, you know, you, you see really from your client base as well. Yeah, right? you know, at, at Material Good, uh, you know, we're... Uh, always kind of seeing and, and, and discussing the, tr the trends for, for jewelry, for timepieces, for art, right. uh, for, you know, rare leather goods. And, and I think that there's a way, you know, never, never buy to uh, make um, you know, purely to make right, a, yeah, like to I, make I'm, it. I'm always against that kind yeah. of philosophy. Like I want, I want this watch to flip it to make right. money. Um, but it's always good to kind of know where you, you know, lie if when you want to trade it in or, right. or, or flip yeah. it or. Put and it you guys to will kind of also give people a little bit of an inkling towards that as well. Like, well yeah, you, can, yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, we we'll, we are very lucky in that our two anchor brands yes. are two of the most collectible brands Huge. on planet Earth. Huge. I mean, let's just to give you an example. Like this RM35, if you bought it at retail, it was like what? Like so, I think retail back in the day was like 112, right. and then the market was, you know, somewhere from like 70 to 85 or 90. Right now, these watches are 115, yeah, uh, yeah. 117, right. and 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 that's not being like that's the real market for right. them, and and I think. Um, and, and I think with other RMs, it's even, you know, more so. And I, I think that speaks to the greatness of the brand. Yes. Uh, you know, because they make only 3,500 and watches. now 4,000 watches. Yeah. And, and they're all incredibly attuned to what people love. That's right. And, and they're made with an eye for, for love and design. Yes. And they become very, very, Co very collectible. collectible. Yeah, yeah. as so we were talking about the 27, you know, like if you had, because if you managed to get one of those at retail, you basically would have made yourself another three, four hundred thousand yeah. dollars already. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's, I think that's pretty special. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think it would even in a, a Arm 11 Jean Todd, you know, that sort of blue yeah, TPT yeah, watch. Yeah. I recently heard of someone paying 150 
thousand dollars above retail and, and just for that watch. And, you know? I, and yeah. I think that that and that speaks to the how amazing to me that speaks to how amazing the brand is. Yes, uh, yes. creating things that are so rare yes. and so sought after. Yes. And and I think AP also does that. I mean, the fifteen two hundred two is uh, a piece that's way 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 over retail. But again. Only buy things that you love and, and you want to wear move and, and you. have fun with. Yeah. Are you the type of guy that like believes in the sort of like double sealed padding? No, See, no, I hate no. That. I, I wear all of my shit. Like yes. I don't. Uh, I, I try to keep them very pristine. Uh, I, I feel that's like such a uh, like the keep it in that plastic is such yeah, a douche, I'm not douchey a, move. I'm not a safe queen. Right. Like you know. Like I also. Like, it, like, I, how do you, because there's like people selling like minute repeaters or torbio minute repeaters in the, the sealed condition. How do you know if that thing even works? Yeah. You, you know yeah. what I mean? I and mean, it's yeah, probably the worst, that if, if it's it's sealed, probably the worst like, thing yeah. for the world. watch to just be sitting yeah. there for like year on year, you a, know? A timepiece should be enjoyed, should be wear, should, be alive, should you know? live exactly. a life. Uh, I, I wholly, wholy, wholly believe in that. Okay. So, you know, I think the last watch we, we have to discuss is have a watch to. that I, I, I will admit now I know very little about. Yeah. It's a Casio G-Shock, but a very specific one made for the 25th anniversary of Bathing Ape. Correct. Uh, so this is my latest uh, uh, pickup. And, you know, I, I'm not like a hype beast or like, you know, in, into that. But in the early 2000s, I loved vape when it was new. Um, and then I had the opportunity to get this watch because it was, you know, limited and all that stuff. And I was like, I have to get this watch. I can't not, you know, a full <laughs> vape camo, all right. giant uh, world timey G-Shock. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had to. I, it's my first G-Shock, admittedly. I don't know, uh, you know, I haven't collected G-Shocks. Right. Adam, I know, loves, loves the brand yes. um, and is very familiar with them. But I could not get this like ridiculously awesome watch. Amazing. You, ma you mentioned Adam, um, who is the founder of uh, Red, Red Bar. Bar. Yes. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about, because we're going to be interviewing him for this series as well. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about your relationship with him and what he and Red Bar yeah. mean to you. Sure. So uh, I think first the whole crew, Adam, Kathleen, Atom, the, the photographer, they're... James also. Uh, from, James yeah. as well from Analog Shift. From Analog Shift, right. Um, they're all amazing people. You right. know, who you see them as publicly is who they are privately. Right. And you can't say that about a lot of yes, people. Yes, very know? great. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I was very, very fortunate years ago to be welcomed into to Red Bar. And Red Bar has taught me not only a lot about collecting, uh, but I've made some of my closest friends, you know, over the past six or, or however many years. Uh, amazing. And, 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 you know, it's, it's a funny thing because at Red Bar, uh, you never get judged on the cost of the timepiece. Which so is great. I, I yeah. love that. Uh, you know, you'll see, uh, you know, there will be Red Bar members who own two, you know, Swatch System 51s. Right. Which, by the way, I think are amazing which watches. Are awesome, yeah. And historically important watches yes. and, and should be in, in, in every collection. Right. Um, and, uh, you, you know, and you'll see these two next to a piece unique, you know, Grubel for say. Right. Uh, and then, and there's this crazy, and then, you know, the, the person who owns the Grubel will pick up the Swatch, the person who owns the Swatch will pick, pick up, up the Grubel. Yeah. And, and that, I think, is kind of the magic of Red Bar, where there's no pretension, there's no anything. It's just people who really, really love timepieces and want to nerd out. Yes. One other thing that I think needs to be mentioned that Red Bar gets a lot of credit for is I see a huge push of Red Bar bringing female collectors oh, to really? the community. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I, I think probably the most underserved demographic in our nerdy world is female collectors. Right. Uh, both, you know, and, and, and again, a place where AP gets a ton of credit. Yes. The first flying tourbillon that AP has ever made yes. was, was a, a, a ladies concept, yeah. uh, you know, to That's do cool an, a, a double balance <laughs> yeah. open worked watch yeah. uh, frosted that is geared towards ladies. Like that's pushing, you know, high watchmaking towards ladies. And I, I am a huge fan of that. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and Red Bar gets a lot of credit for that. Kathleen gets a lot of credit Who's for that. Who's the CEO, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that... I think it's a really special place, and anyone who has the you know privilege to be associated with it should should treat it as such. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Thank you, brother. Man, really such a pleasure. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys.